Welcome to Trending in Education. Mike Palmer here, as always. Really interesting topic, something, uh, honestly, I didn't have as deep an understanding, perhaps as I should have had coming in to understand uh, the impact of immigration enforcement on educational equity. There's a book called Schools Under Siege. Patricia Gandara and Jung Young E are the co-authors and editors of this book. Patricia and Jung Young, thank you so much for joining. And beginning with you, Patricia, I always like to begin by getting our guests' origin stories. What got you to this point in your professional life? I know you have some really interesting things going on, particularly around the Civil Rights Project, which is in some ways really a driver around topics like what's discussed in the book. But can you briefly give our listeners some context around what got you to this point in your professional life? Sure. Both Joy and I have some of immigrant stories. I'm the daughter of Mexican immigrant. And as such, I have oftentimes been the first and only Mexican-American woman in various places where I have been. Mm -hmm. I guess I would say it has fallen to me oftentimes to try and explain the situation of Latinos or Mexican-Americans in this country. Mm -hmm. So I've written extensively over the last several decades about the situation, education, and Mexican-origin students. Mm -hmm. So as things began to ramp up around immigration enforcement, it was obviously impacting these same students in incredible ways. Yeah, And uh, it shifted my focus over towards immigration enforcement mm -hmm. and the education of immigrant students. Yeah, and just real quickly, can you catch us up on the Civil Rights Project? Yeah, I co-direct the Civil Rights Project, which this year is 25 years old. It was founded at Harvard University for its first 10 years and then moved for the next 15 to UCLA. And we focus a great deal on research and advocacy for racial equity. Yeah, and it was really striking to me how the connection is made around education and human rights, education as a civil right. And what was really interesting to me was that there's a, a relatively brief chapter on the context into which the, the, the immigration conversation in the United States has evolved. And, and then in particular, the impact that it has on the children of immigrants, but really the whole families in light of many of the, the immigration policies that we'll, we'll hopefully get into a bit as part of the conversation. But moving to, to you, Joy, can you catch us up on what got you to this point in your professional life? And maybe we could start to talk a little bit about how the two of you got together on the book. Mm -hmm. Thank you for having me, Mike. My name is Joy Yi. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Teaching and Learning at Louisville Marymount University in Los Angeles. California. I started my doctor journey about 10 years ago, back in 2010, at the University of California, Los Angeles. And I was um, incredibly fortunate to have Dr. Patricia Gantara as my advisor and mentor at the time. And since then, I have um, looked at various issues around education equity, including school segregation in education for English immigrant learners in the prior English education context and education for immigrant families as well. And after I got my doctorate um, in education from UCLA, I worked as a postdoctoral scholar at the UCLA Civil Rights Project, where Dr. Kandara um, is a co director. And so I worked there about uh, four years as a postdoctoral scholar. Yep. And then I um, joined Lawyer Lamb Marymount University back in 2018. As um, Dr. Gandara mentioned, I'm an immigrant scholar myself. So this topic around the impact of immigration enforcement actions and policy changes, it really relates to me in many ways, including my personal identity and professional identity as well. Mm -hmm. Over the past years, I was supposed to maintain my legal status I and mean, everything you know, to keep my documents and be just status updated. So mm -hmm. I know how challenging each step in, you know, preparing documents for immigrant families and students as well. And I also have a family members and friends. You yeah. Know, 
parts of the nation who had gone through, you know, the same thing. This is part of my story and mm -hmm. part of my family and friends' stories as well. Yeah. And um, at Lula Mary Mount University, I have worked with students who are actually teachers in Los Angeles. One common thing among my um, students, they work in uh, Los Angeles' most challenging schools where the majority of their students are from immigrant families or yeah. minorities. This is my student's story. So this is deeply tied with my professional identity as well. Yeah, that makes sense. For those for whom this is their personal story, this is something that folks understand much more personally and intuitively. But for those of us who may not be as familiar with the psychological context in which immigrant families are living, and it, it's not a new thing. There's a long history of this that you really outline within the book, the culture of fear. Patricia, you, you talk about both fear and redemption as the closing note. Can you help us understand the context in which families are living nowadays, just so that folks who may be less familiar with why this impacts education and why understanding the impact on students and kids is important. Can you help us understand the context that folks are living in and, and the relationship between immigration policy and enforcement and the, the way folks feel about their educational lives? Sure. First, I would begin with the fact that there are something like 6 million children in our schools in the United States who have at least one person in their family who's undocumented. And that puts the entire family at constant risk. So these 6 million children are, as Joy was noting, they tend to be in the most challenged schools, the poorest schools with the fewest resources, with the teachers who have the least preparation for working with them. And so we have a lot of children who are at a very big disadvantage in the schools to begin with. Hmm. And then they have the constant fear of what happens if some ICE agent comes to our door. And when I get home in the afternoon, my parents aren't there. Mm -hmm. What teachers tell us and other educators tell us is that these students can't concentrate. They are oftentimes just very distressed and disturbed and they're not learning. Right. And to the extent that this kind of stress affects these students, it also affects the other kids in the classroom and the other kids at their school because it's very disruptive. Mm -hmm. And it affects the teachers because the teachers feel an enormous responsibility for their students and feel that oftentimes they don't have the information or the resources to help these children. Right. So it's creating huge upheaval in our poor schools in this country. Yeah. And it came to a head, really. This is not necessarily new. And in fact, in certain years of the Obama administration, there were actually more deportations right. than, than under Trump. But it became really ugly under Trump. Hmm. And I know Joy can talk a lot about the bullying that occurred in the schools mm -hmm. and how in addition to all of the other things frightening these children, these students, the excessive bullying under the Trump administration made their lives just really virtually impossible. Yeah. So um, I just want to echo what Patricia mentioned. The actual number of deportations in the Obama administration was a lot higher than the one under the Trump government. But at that time, the Obama government was targeting those who had criminal records. But what was different under the Trump administration was that he and his team sent a message that everybody who's in immigration status is the target of uh, deportation or mm -hmm. is kind of enforcement actions in changing policies. So Mr. Ramilo um, Abelica Gonzalez's case, who has lived and raised his children you know, in the United States for many decades. And on his way to the school, you know, to drop one of his you know, daughters, he was um, arrested by an um, ICE agent. When I watched that incident, it gave me a huge 
exclamation mark in my mind what's happening you know, in this country. I'm an immigrant scholar myself and I felt very vulnerable and insecure. What's happening in our classroom where we have the daughter of Mr. Rebecca Gonzalez in the classroom. Her name is Fatima Gonzalez who was recording the incident. Mm. So what's happening to her, how she's doing, you know, in class. Patricia and I, one of the reasons we embarked on this project is we really wondered what's happening in classroom, you know, in school communities. We have seen a wide range of impacts, including bullying, increasing emotional anxiety. Yeah. And decreasing parental involvement and increasing the burden among educators. Michael, I'd like to talk just a little bit about the, historically how immigrants have been viewed. We love to call ourselves a nation of immigrants and we, we love to be proud of our immigrant past. But in fact, across time, immigrants have had a really tough time in this country. We tend to uh, push uh, past that. But there's Three ways in which from the very beginning of the founding of this country, immigrants have been categorized as affecting our economic well-being. In, in other words, at every point in our history when our economy has gone down, mm -hmm. people have turned to immigrants to blame them. I don't have a job because these immigrants are taking my job away from me. Right which is absolutely not the case. And that's been demonstrated over and over. In fact, without immigrants, we wouldn't have a lot of these jobs because U.S. doesn't even uh, have a level of births to mm. replace ourselves. We need these immigrant workers. Mm -hmm. A second way is immigrants and identity, that they're not like us. And so they're changing us. They're changing who we are. And we have this amazing quote in the book from Samuel Huntington at Harvard who talks about the way that Mexican immigrants are destroying the culture. Thirdly, immigrants and national security, they're a threat to us. They're going to harm us in some way. And of course, this really came to a head with 9-11. Right. And all immigrants then became suspect, but particularly Muslim immigrants. And then Donald Trump translated it to the border, even claiming that there were Muslim immigrants, terrorists, uh, coming across the southern border, mm -hmm. for which there was never any uh, evidence that this was true. Yeah. So these are themes that have recurred throughout our history as a nation. Mm -hmm. But they really all came to a head under the Trump administration with this really vicious rhetoric. Yeah. Which is going to be very hard to shake because mm -hmm. even under a more benign administration, that doesn't go away right away. For sure. And I think there's also the perception that we could go back to those types of policies very easily. Are we in the Pax Biden right now? But on the other side of this, we will go back. And if we go back, it may be worse. Literally, Michael. Yeah. Now we have another election coming up in 2022. If we lose yeah. the Congress, Congress might decide to do some very different things about this. So there is absolutely no certainty mm -hmm. for these individuals. Who, by the way, I believe now, the last figure I saw was the average undocumented worker in the United States has lived in the country for something like 18 years without the ability to become documented. Part of our fabric, treat them as the other outside of all of the legal rights. Right. And also, I think the perception of the society we live in, in many ways is dictated by where are you in relation to the immigration policy? Are you actually being hunted in peril because of these decisions? Or is it something that's a little more an abstract issue that I have an opinion on? But even then, the, the, the polling, as I understand, for a lot of these issues are very much in favor of paths to citizenship and a solution for DACA and some of the other immigration issues that, that are outlined really throughout the book. It's just there's a disconnect between the way things poll and generally the way folks are perceiving issues around immigration and then the policy that's actually enacted. But then it sounds like when you're talking about something deeper about the trust of folks within the community of their educational system so that they don't feel like they're putting people they love at risk by attending school. Absenteeism is a major problem, among other things. I will say you did a nice job of getting the emotional depth of the issue conveyed within the book. I feel like I do understand that much better. 
And I did also like the direct reckoning of teachers' voices, which I thought was another really strong element to this conversation, because I think we're all much more comfortable talking about working our issues out through the context of what we think teaching is like nowadays. And I think this is a perspective, a, a set of challenges around teaching that I don't think many of us understood. Can you talk a little bit about what it's like to be a teacher and then the kind of supports and things we might be able to do to help teachers who are trying to address some of these issues? Yeah, I'll start and I'll hand it over to Joy. You know, we have a major problem of teacher shortage in this country. We are not preparing enough teachers to staff our classrooms in any way that we should be doing it. And so this is an ongoing concern in the education community. And so as Joy and I were looking at these issues of the kids in the classroom, it became really evident that teachers were suffering as much as kids were suffering. And something needed to be done about that. In fact, I was very surprised to find in some interviews that I did with extraordinary individuals across the country who were doing extraordinary things on behalf of these children, superintendents, principals, teachers who were organizing their communities to support these children, mm -hmm. just going way out of the bounds uh, that you would imagine to do things for these immigrant families. And oftentimes in very red states, mm -hmm. places where there was not support for what they were doing. Mm -hmm. But in spite of all that they were doing for the families, for the kids, there was almost nobody who said, oh, yeah, we have a program for our teachers. Mm -hmm. So the teachers are grappling with all of this with insufficient information, insufficient resources, not knowing what they can legally or not legally do in any particular case. Yeah. And yet the schools and the people who administer the schools just hadn't really thought about how is this impacting teachers? Yeah. And, and I'll let Joy say more about how it does impact the teachers. Yeah. I just want to add one thing that I found very unfortunate is that we haven't had an opportunity to really focus on what's the legacy from the Trump government when it comes to the impact of repetitive immigration enforcement actions and what are the repercussions What's the scope of the repercussions and how that um, has affected students from immigrant families and those who are not, you know, from immigrant families, as well as educators. We have gone through a lot of things in this nation, including racial awakening, protests, insurrection, and of course, in a pandemic crisis. Yeah. With um, all these incidents, we haven't had that proper opportunity to solely focus on, you know, what's the legacy from the previous government um, when it comes to the impacts of the immigration enforcement actions. I found this um, opportunity to advance our discussions around how to support students and how to support educators. And I know that we have American Rescue Plan funds in place um, in Square, but I don't think there is a specific conversation or the plans about how to support students from immigrant families and how to support educators and working with those students. When it comes to financial impact or public health issues, yeah. uh, it's not secret that a lot of immigrant families and a lot of the students of color, you know, they have been hit the hardest. So we really need to help and support students from immigrant families and educators working with them. I think that kind of conversation is, is absent and we need more specific and targeted plans and strategies to support um, students from immigrant families and educators as well. Yeah. And it's, it very much comes through in the book that there's a lot of awareness around immigration issues, immigration policies. There's a way in which it's portrayed in the media, whichever media you choose to consume, but the conversation about the impact to education and how widespread it is, uh, to your point, in terms of the 6 million, uh, Patricia, like this is a large number and there's even larger numbers. If you think about the extended families and the ways in which people might understand some of these issues, can you talk a little bit about the methodology, how broad you went and, and who you surveyed and some of the perspectives that were, were shared in the book? In 2017, when this issue you know, really emerged under the Trump government, we started developing a survey questionnaire to reach out to as many educators as possible. 
across the nation, um, including all four regions from west to north east. Eventually, we ended up having more than 3,600 um, educators from 760 schools. In the survey, we covered a wide range of topics, but we made the survey um, short so that educators you know, could finish. Any headlines, any findings based on the survey that folks might be interested by? For example, more than 80% of respondents said that they had observed behavioral issues in their classroom with mm. these students, that the students were acting out or not able to engage in the instruction. Mm -hmm. More than 80% of yeah. respondents. I, I would also just note that to get 3,600 surveys back from across the country is a challenge because you have to go into school districts and you have to convince them that this is worth their time and energy in an area that particularly when we were doing this was highly sensitive. And so we took it as evidence of just how powerful an impact this was having in the schools that so many people were willing to fill out this survey yeah. and send us their comments about what they were experiencing. Mm -hmm. And it's not just a border state issue. Uh, 13 yeah. different states. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And, and as Joy said, in all, all four census regions. Yeah. So we have from the Northeast to the Southwest and, right. uh, and on. Yeah. 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 And then the context around who's impacted, because there's the illegal immigration side of things versus the the visa side of things. That's one comment I would like to make, which has always made me a little bit crazy understanding what I do about the immigration system. As many people love to tout that they're pro-immigrant as long as they come in legally. Hmm. But the fact is we have set up an immigration system that does not allow most of the workers to come in legally. Mm -hmm. We've capped it artificially even though we know that we need these workers. So we know they're coming in. The employers depend upon these people coming in. Mm -hmm. And yet we have no mechanism for allowing them to do this, mm -hmm. quote, legally. It, you know, it's a farce. And that's particularly the case in terms of Mexican-Americans and the relationship between Mexico and, and the U.S. around immigration, which is particularly fraught in light of the rhetoric of the the Trump campaign, and that's an area that, that you've been very close to throughout your career. And it's increasingly Central Americans, in mm -hmm. fact, who mm -hmm. are arriving at the border. Right. No real legitimate way. The other one that people love to uh, tout is that their forebears came in legally. And so if these folks would just come in legally like mm -hmm. their forebears did, mm -hmm. they would be fine with it. Well, the fact of the matter is until 1924, we had not invented illegality in immigration. Hmm. Pretty much everybody came in as is. And there was no holding people out on legal terms. Mm -hmm. 1924 is the origin of what became ICE, mm -hmm. uh, the Border Patrol. Yeah. Prior to that, you could walk across our border any day you wanted to, mm -hmm. uh, either north or south, and there was nobody who was going to stop you. Yeah. Yeah. And then now in light of the pandemic and the insurrection, which you were mentioning, I think people do feel more under threat, under attack, and then how that then manifests in their relationship towards immigrant populations and the experience of being someone who is here as an immigrant is even more challenging than perhaps it ever has been. Where do we go from here? It seems like there's a culture of, of fear. But then there's also this idea of redemption and some opportunity, some, some rays of hope, despite the fact that we're shedding a light on an area of genuine challenge, something that is very much tied to civil rights. Where do we go from here? What are some ways in which people might be activated? Are there any ways in which we can build on a positive foundation that we might have around addressing some of these issues? Well, we dedicate a chapter to the various things that we think we need to be doing right away. I would just mention first off that at a very basic level, departments of education at the state level or, or superintendents of education 
by and large, are not providing adequate information for their schools about what's le legal and what's not legal and what they can do for these young people. And in fact, immigrants do have rights. Most of the rights in the Constitution also include immigrants. Mm -hmm. Constitution doesn't say U.S. citizens have this right. It says persons. Mm -hmm. And people don't know that. People don't know what their rights are. And of course, we also talk about the rights of immigrant children to language education. Mm -hmm. And in fact, documented or undocumented, our constitution says that all children in this country, regardless of their immigration status, are due a full and adequate and free education through the 12th grade. Mm -hmm. And yet people don't know this. Yeah. So maybe that's my ray of hope on this is by getting more conversant in these policies and actually understanding that in many ways there is pro-immigrant language and policy and things out there that are existing in the world. It's just perhaps not enough folks are aware of it, not as many folks are being taught about it, and then we're not necessarily even educating our educators and providing them the supports that they need to be more fully present. Maybe there's some hope also in light of the, the tremendous challenges and traumas we've gone through in light of the, the pandemic and George Floyd and the racial awakening that we were talking about. We're all much more aware of trauma-informed practices and understanding that folks are at risk, understanding that there's maybe a, an added dimension with real depth to the level of psychological trauma that immigrants and immigrant families are, are going through, and it's going to take some time to come out of it. I guess it's an argument for raising awareness so that we can be more empathetic and perhaps be trained better in terms of engaging with this population. One of the things that immigrant advocates have pointed out is that during the pandemic, immigrants in the workforce were disproportionately essential workers forced to go to work even without adequate protections for themselves and have disproportionately felt the effects of the pandemic, mm -hmm. you know, both in terms of their health, their rates of death, as well as their economic well-being. So advocates have pointed out in our worst times here in this country, it's been immigrants who have stepped up to make things continue to work for the rest of the country. Mm -hmm. Isn't it time for us to do them the favor of at least giving them some kind of legal status? Yeah. We'll see how that plays out over time. Yeah. And then at the same time, the teachers who are culturally sensitive to the, the challenges immigrant children are facing and also understand the practices around policing of these populations in the U.S. Depending on where you live, you may just not be as aware of these things and once you are aware of it, that is the first step to actually open up your consciousness and perhaps think about how to help the educators. Because it, it does sound as though you're both envisioning education as being a critical component in the success of first-generation immigrants and, and folks who are coming to the U.S. Education is the promise of the American dream, but we really need educators to understand how it's, it's a very challenging path that these children and families are on. Yeah, I can't agree with you more. I mean, when it comes to uh, teacher education programs, from the perspective of uh, what you just mentioned, Mike, we really need to increase our awareness and consciousness in terms of developing more information around how to support students from immigrant families or students who speak another language other than English. I mean, I think there's a lack of support in practices in developing you know, teachers who can understand the diverse you know, cultures and backgrounds among students, especially in racially diverse countries. We need to make more conscious effort to prepare you know, students, teachers in a better way in the mm -hmm. teacher education programs. At the same time, when it comes to K-12 um, education curriculum, we need to include more specific and deliberate content to recognize and acknowledge diverse immigration pathways and immigrant cultures, traditions, and things like that. So, for example, we haven't really discussed the impact on Asian Americans in the pandemic, you know, context um, in our book, because mm -hmm. 
the time, you know, we collected the data, the pandemic was not there. So right. not able to capture the pandemic crisis and its impact on Asian students specifically. But what we have heard over the past months is stop Asian hate. And uh, a lot of, you know, hate crimes and you know, targeting agents, Asian Americans. But in the immigration context, in many cases, their voices in their um, existence have been ignored or been dismissed in many ways. So um, we re really need to diversify in you know, our stories and curriculum when it comes to discussions about immigrants and different pathways you know, they have gone through. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, the name of the book is Schools Under Siege, The Impact of Immigration Enforcement on Educational Equity, edited by Patricia Gandara and Jung Young E. Really wonderful having you both here for this conversation. As I mentioned, the book was certainly illuminating to me, and there'll be links to the book on the, the show page for this episode. As we're getting closer to conclusion, I always ask my guests for something out there in the world that is inspiring them or, or capturing their interests these days. Just some concluding thoughts and feel free to bring in something from the outside that surprises us. Perhaps I could surprise you a little bit by telling you that another project that I'm engaged in very much right now is the 600,000 U.S. citizen children who are now in Mexico as a result of all of these years of deportations, mm. trying to integrate themselves into the Mexican school system. Mm. And if you think we're having trouble in this country, Mexico has not been an immigrant receiving nation. Mm. There's very little consciousness about kids joining their schools who look like their classmates, but don't speak Spanish or don't read or write it. Wow. Kind of a very different educational background. Mm. And the teachers have no idea what to do with these students. Mm -hmm. So these are 600,000 U.S. citizen kids hmm. who likely as not will eventually come back to the U.S. seriously undereducated hmm. and with nothing in place to help them integrate into the system. So hmm. that's another thing that we're grappling with. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And then if folks want to learn more about this stuff, is the, the Civil Rights Project, is there a website they can go to? Absolutely. www.civilrightsproject.ucla.edu. Okay. Awesome. And Joy, any concluding thoughts from you as we're wrapping up? I believe in the power of the research and I really want the you know, policymakers and other stakeholders um, to leverage our research as evidence to advance discussions around immigration, immigration and immigrant students to help and support them in a more proper way. So that's my concluding thought. Yeah. Thank you so much to both of you for joining. Hopefully our listeners enjoyed it as much as I did. Patricia Gandara and Joy E, thank you so much for joining. Thank you, Michael. It was our pleasure. Thank and, you. Yeah. And uh, for those of you who enjoyed what you heard, uh, be sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. We'll be back again soon. This is Trending in Education. Mm -hmm.